Welcome to the RiskAdvisor.com podcast. I'm Sal LaFrary. I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Jim Henry. Before we begin, we're going to ask you to push that like button and remind each of you to subscribe to the show. Uh, having, um, having people follow us and sign up to listen is really important for us. Please leave comments for us because they are equally important and we'd love to know what you want to hear and what you want, to, uh, what you want us to be able to talk about. So today we're going to talk about video trends in physical security. What's new, what's coming, possibly a little bit of historical of where we were and see what's new in the world and what we can expect in the upcoming year. Jim, this is, um, you know, the technical side of this. This is your bailiwick. This is, this is your world. Uh, what do you think? What do you see? My world as, uh, <laughs> as it uh, started out many years ago in, uh, <laughs> in analog is a far reach from, from where we are today. So that was back in the day of tubes. We're going to try right? and, uh, that, <laughs> that was, was back, back in the day, day of tubes. Of tubes right? was. It was tubes. It was simple. Yeah. You know, and God, it was, it was such a simple time. <laughs> tubes and <laughs> one-way one radios. Time, but... Tubes and one-way anyway, radios. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what we're going to try and do is put some, uh, you know, logical understanding and perception buzzwords that they continue to hear, you know, in this industry and, you know, what does it mean and is it real and, you know, is it vaporware and what's it going to cost me and will I be able to handle it and all that, the other fear factor. But, you know, it's, it, these things, these come, these things are, are developed um, because there's a need and what we've had in, in security here and the, you know, uh, you know, since uh, the early days oh. when you had two or three cameras and a, you know, and, and a VHS recorder and maybe a, a quad splitter, you know, now we've gone to thousands and ten, the tens of thousands of cameras and moving all of this information and storing all this information, you know, requires us to come up with uh, with new technology on on how to be able to handle that because the human element, is, it's way past that. So we have with us today, uh, our guest is uh, Darren Giacomini, who is the Director of Advanced Solutions and Architecture at BCD International. They are a trusted global video data infrastructure manufacturer and with 17 years experience in the industry on Darren's part. Darren's responsibilities include managing BCD's advanced technology portfolio, which includes hybrid hyper-converged infrastructure, as well as managing engineering at BCD's networking solutions portfolio. Darren specializes in designing and implementing high availability infrastructures to support real-time video surveillance application for BCD's customers. With over 10 years of uh, real-time video experience in, in advanced technical uh, training experience and curriculum developed in Microsoft and routing and switching technologies, he has diversified knowledge of Avaya, Brocade, Cisco, HP, and Juniper platform. So, Darren, welcome to the show. Thank you. That's a mouthful, and I know it's going to be a, you know a challenge for you to speak uh, to the to the to the level of our of our audience here. But <clears throat> help us from from your perspective with uh, you know a little a little retro of uh, of that uh, history slide that I talked about here of. You know where we came from the from the early days of of four cameras, a quad, and a VHS machine, and and on to where we are right now, and how that uh, funny word that I just talked about, hyperconverged uh, infrastructure, is playing a role here in trying to find out how to handle all the stuff we're generating. Well, Jim, thank you for the introduction. It's uh, seems a little long winded. Uh, I say that ironically. It wasn't but a couple of months ago, my wife was trying to explain to people what I did. And she turned to me during a party and said, what exactly do you do? <laughs> and so <clears throat> there can be some confusion about it. But uh, I've known Jim going back to, to my days when I was at Telco back when we had matrix bays and encoding and, and IP digital coming into the market. And the markets evolved dramatically since then. So when we first started looking at, at market trends, and we're starting with the emergence of IP video and encoded IP video, you had constrained variable bit rates and you had target bit rates of 2 to 4 megabits per second. And it was pretty linear and pretty constrained. And you had a pretty good, say, idea of what you were dealing with, with respect to your infrastructure, the data flow, and what you were going to get out of these cameras. The world's starting to change. 
you're seeing more and more analytics being pushed to the edge. You're seeing the evolution of edge computing, artificial intelligence, and other things that are being adapted uh, into these technologies. And as you start to look at high resolution or high megapixel cameras, the bit rates are changing a lot. I use an example of a particular vendor's camera that I was looking at at a casino. Uh, it was probably going about two years ago. And the published bit rate for this was a target range of 6 to 8 megabits per second. Yet when I looked at what it was actually doing on this PTC camera, when it was moving, when things were changing, if I was doing the analysis on the network, I was seeing that bit rate spike well over to 100 and 200 megabits per second when the video was set to its highest capabilities. And that can be a very, very demanding thing for not only a video management system, but a network in storage to deal with. So we're seeing trends in the industry that you're seeing much, much higher resolution. And now you're seeing the release of these multi-sensor cameras that can do 270 degrees, 360, 180 degree videos stitched together. And you look at the bit rate that's being driven off of this. And more importantly than the bit rate, the actual number of packets per second can almost overwhelm a network infrastructure and overwhelm storage that sits behind that. And so we're seeing the dynamics change and that we're having to develop these very robust architectures to deal with the changes in IP video surveillance. It used to be that we had hundreds and hundreds of cameras covering a region. Now that's being contracted down. And now you're having fewer cameras that are targeting that particular area with high resolution and megapixel cameras. But you're also seeing those points of failure are being reduced. As a single camera goes out, more of your coverage is being reduced at that point when you lose them. I'll throw a, uh, a real life story in that that, that maybe our, our audience can relate to. And this is 20 years ago. So we're talking early in the days of, of digital video. And of course, um, and you remember um, Emil, and he's part of this story. Yes, so sir. we're setting up we're setting up cameras for uh, for an installation, and of course, Emil is tweaking everything to the nth degree, getting getting some really nice, you know, crisp, well focused shots. And it happened to be in the early days of uh, of all the colo sites that were popping up, you know, in the early part of the century. And we're looking at these cages with you know chain link fences, fences around them, right? And you know it was a, another manufacturer's um, infrastructure that we were that we were streaming into, and we kept crashing the system, and we couldn't see anything that we were we were doing wrong. So lo and behold, you know we finally got to somebody at at your level within this manufacturer. and we explained to him what we were doing and 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 the scenes that we had, and he went, You've actually done too good a job setting up the cameras. Try defocusing the camera a little bit so you're not catching every little aspect of that chain link fence. And sure enough, that solved the problem. The, the spikes, the high frequencies that we were getting from that really crisp image. Now, this is long before you know, the kind of cameras that we have today. I mean, this was just, this was really with an analog camera that was going through, you know, through a converter, an encoder. But we started to touch on the kind of things that we're seeing today at a, that you described at a, at a much greater level. A absolutely. And, and infrastructure is going to play a big part in this. It, it, you know, I see, I talk to a lot of integrators that, that believe that uh, a network switch is a network switch. And there could be nothing further from the truth. Yes, all of the hardware is predominantly made by three or four manufacturers around the world. But the most important thing in dealing with these more advanced cameras is how many packets per second it can actually take going into that. And that requires an inline buffer. We've almost created this anomaly of this problem within the industry. The way that a switch works is you have 24 ports or 48 ports. And of those 48 ports, maybe 46 of them are cameras and one or two of them are archives. And on a network switch, you've got 46 ports competing for those two ports that you're trying to record to. And there's going to be contention and there's going to be overlap in those requests. And that's where it becomes absolutely essential that you get a good network switch with a good buffer. So when you have conflicts, you don't lose that data. You don't lose that video. And unfortunately, in the industry, we're still kind of stuck in this paradigm of a network switch is a network switch. As long as it gets line rate, it's going to be fine. And it's just not the case. As these cameras are getting, getting more detailed and they're getting more services and, and more capabilities, it's absolutely 100% required 
that you put an enterprise grade infrastructure or switch beneath that. So are we at a we're at a point where you know the well-intentioned uh, efforts to try and solve these problems are not enough looking holistically at the problem. <laughs> Well, I think they're well intended. And I think the the overall goal of what we're trying to get, you know, you've got this deep state learning they're putting into cameras to potentially perform analytics and deep state learning on the edge to identify things. And that's going to play right into the evolution of 5G, where you're going to decide what you record and decide what you don't record at, at the edge of the network. But with all of that complexity comes increased rate of communication and your infrastructure has to be able to handle that. So to some extent, I think we're almost reaching back into, and this is something you're going to be familiar with. When we started taking the transition from analog to IP digital, there were a lot of unknowns and there were a lot of things that we weren't ready for. As we start to evolve to this edge-based computing and IoT devices that are providing a, just a plethora amount of data uh, into the infrastructure, we really need to be careful that we build things that are capable of handling the type of, uh, of speed and line rate that we need. Well, there's a old adage, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something, you know, and the and the why and the how is is, you know, is very important. Do you think that the problem is really understood by the majority of industry stakeholders at this point? Let's let's keep focusing on, you know, any problem, any problem is solvable if if you recognize that it's a problem. So, to what degree do you think it's uh, people are still you know, overlooking that, and they're and they're into the, and they're and they're into the, the the shiny object sex appeal of new devices and whatnot without really looking at the implications. And you know, we kind of went through this learning curve in the early part of the century when we moved from from analog to digital, and that first big pushback by you know by <laughs> IT, you know, by the IT folks on what we were dumping on their network. You know, have have we learned that lesson well enough? Yes and no. I think from the perspective of understanding how we approach projects, to some extent, we have a number of vendors that have. And then we have a number of vendors that are still kind of stuck in what I call the rut. I can't tell you the number of integrators that are dealing with end users that cycle through VMS platforms. VMS platform A, well, I don't like the way this performs and I'm getting loss of video. And to be very clear with you, it's, it's always the same seven common problems that you complain about in this industry. Artifacting in the video, latent PTC control, loss of video, loss of recording, system instability, database corruption, or just complete and total loss of functionality. Right. And each one of those can be nailed down to infrastructure-related issues. I found right. the following. If you've contacted a vendor and you're working with a very, very competent, well-known vendor at a VMS level or an IP camera level, and you cannot resolve the problem within two to three weeks of working with their particular uh, support queue... I almost guarantee you have some kind of infrastructure related issue. And so what I see is, is people will cycle through, well, I don't like vendor A for the VMS platform because I'm getting these problems. They'll go to vendor B and lo and behold, they don't like that vendor either. And then they go to C and then they go to D. <clears throat> All the while, I, I, I use an example. If you give me a very, very high performance sports car and you put me behind the, the, the wheel of that sports car, first of all, you're nuts. Second, if you give me the keys and you tear me loose on a dirt road full of potholes, I'm not going to be able to unleash the performance of that high-performance sports car. And that's kind of the, the, the adage that we're stuck in in video surveillance. I keep cycling through IP cameras and I keep cycling through VMS platforms, but I'm never worried about the quality of the road that I'm running on. And until you get that right, it is just going to be grief over and over and over again. And I watch these, I watch these integrators almost blow through their profit margin in rolling trucks to site for things that they can never actually really solve because there's a lack of understanding that yes, you can buy a network switch and put it in. But if you don't configure it properly, if you don't optimize it for video, if you don't set the right configuration parameters for it, you're just never going to have the performance that you expect out of it. And what makes matters worse is generally that spiking that you started to talk to or data storms you know, that are intermittent can really have you chasing your tail, have frustrate the end users, frustrate the integrators because it's you know it's it's not consistent. You know it'll come it'll come and go, and they don't. And until you get to the why uh, that that is occurring, you're you're not gonna you're not you're not gonna solve it by being a, a in my old dad's old days a tube jockey. 
<laughs> Absolutely. And, and so this was kind of a problem that I started to approach about 8 years ago. I started when I was working for Pelco and then during my time with Avaya and Extreme and then finally with BCD Video. We started looking at ways that how can we optimize the network configuration to make sure it's done properly the first time. And we've gotten to a point now where we can use what I call software-defined automation to simplistically push the configurations out and make sure you'll be amazed at how many of those problems will absolutely vaporize. Well, that's a great place to take our first break. And then we will get a little deeper into the, the logistics of that approach to kind of correcting these, uh, these problems. You are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by myself, Jim Henry and Sal Freire. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So Darren, why don't you uh, continue on that uh, enlightened uh, brainstorm that you had a, a, you know, a few years ago on, um, on how really to break this problem down you know, on the, at the infrastructure side and um, save these VMS platforms from undue uh, blame. <laughs> well, as I started to look at it, and as I said, we started back in, in doing the network architecture on the side from Pelco. I started noticing that the majority of the installations were greenfield and standalone, and the majority of them fit a repetitive pattern where the integrator had control over the IP space and what IP addresses they used. It was standalone network. They had control of the infrastructure. They had control over their own dark, dark fiber interconnects that were there. And, and I would say that hasn't changed much. You do have some, I say, assimilation into the, the IT side of the network. But I still say that you have this 80-20 split where 80% of it is pretty much still controlled by the physical security integrators. They may be using some of the fiber uplinks that are associated with the IT infrastructure. But, but most IT managers don't want this on their network anyway, because they don't know enough about the data flows, etc. So when you have control over that, <clears throat> and you know it's a repetitive entity, I started building with Avaya and Extreme these automated scripts built into the switches that you could simply provide a variable into it. If you knew you had 20 switches that were going into your network, you would deploy the scripting from switch one through 20, interconnect them, and everything was completely automated. Everything was completely optimized for video surveillance the way it should be without having to actually go out and ascertain high-level certification or training. The problem with that is, is it required that you, number one, use 100% of IA or extreme infrastructure uh, because it was it was solely encompassed in their technology. So it didn't scale well to other vendors and it didn't scale well to <clears throat> environments that weren't using a single vendor for the network. So when I came over to BCD Video, I actually partnered with a company called Alcatel Lucent. And uh, I, I currently you know, work with them and sit on their cabinet advisory board uh, for customers. And we've developed this idea that rather than when I first came into the industry, going out on with my hair on fire, trying to train everybody to be an IP expert, everybody to be a networking expert. Why not simplify it to the point you don't have to be a networking expert? Why don't we make it so simple that I can take a group of 20 technicians in a matter of hours, have them all deploying infrastructure exactly like myself or somebody from my team would, and doing this all from a smartphone uh, or from a template-based computer infrastructure? And so that's what we have with the Alcatel Lucent platform. We can now take layer two and layer three infrastructures and by applying templates that you control the IP space from your phone, you choose from one to 40 templates. And no matter how you interconnect them between the switches, number one, they're set up 100% optimized for video transmission. They're set up for resiliency if you want redundant connections. And they're set up to deliver the highest level performance you can get out of the box with absolutely zero training from the IP side or from the networking side. So what's the downside to that? Why would there be pushback to that? There's not really pushback. It's more about getting people informed of, of what we built and what the difference is between grabbing a switch that you can get off of the shelf or, or from a vendor and simply putting it in and plugging it in. And if I get video, everything's great. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I'll give you an example. I had a, a hospital that was doing that exact same thing. They were plugging the switches in, star configuration, everything's great. 
But every time a PC powered down or a camera was plugged in or any device plugged in, everything in the network, all the video feeds would actually blank out for a second and then come back. And that was happening both live and recorded video. There's a technology called spanning tree built into the switches that looks for loop protection. And every time that you plug a device in or change a state of a link that's under that spanning tree, it will actually recalculate everything on the network, which causes the ports to go down and come back up. And if you don't know to go in and configure edge ports for devices like cameras and workstations and servers, or states that are going to constantly go up and down in their link, every single link in your network will experience these brownouts of video where it'll actually go down for a second and come back up. And it's just something that we've done a poor job of, of educating people that needs to be done. But rather than going through the difficulty of trying to train everybody on the ins and outs of different vendors and what to do, as an industry, we just need to take a more simplistic approach. Make it obtainable by everybody and remove the mystique from the networking side. Make it approachable. Do you think that there's the pushback then is, um, I won't say pushback, but just say it's an education process from the integrators that have control over those, those elements of the solution. But in the case where a large customer with an ID department may retain control over the the hardware selection, the switch selection and whatnot, is is that not maybe a um, you know as open an ear to these issues for the kind of data that they're flowing around? Is you know, might that be another element of the of, of the problem that we need to overcome? Absolutely. And that's where kind of phase two of what I look at with this project with Alcatel Lucent comes in. You're going to be given your own particular IP subset. You may even be given your own switches that you're going to run off. And those switches may actually uplink into a corporate environment. So the ability to set a gateway or the ability to set configurations to where you can uplink that could be critical. If the infrastructure is being supplied by the IT department, a lot of times you have, I won't say a more difficult challenge, but a more complex situation. When you look at, at building out data centers and building out infrastructures for IT, everything is inward to outward flowing. All the data comes from the data center and it goes out to the customers and it's all centralized. You could not be a more polar opposite of how you're actually flowing data in a physical security environment. You don't have 100 servers or 50 servers flowing data out. You may have 10,000 cameras bringing data in and your storage your networking, your compute, your buffering on your networking, the bit rate you need to be able to support ingress going to those devices all needs to be optimized for a complete reverse paradigm of data flow that IT is used to. And so a lot of them can find themselves in trouble you know, trying to apply traditional IT data techniques to what we do in physical security because they just don't know. They don't understand the data flows of how they're working. Do you find the, uh, you know, the, 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 the IT folks are... Um kind of get their nose out of joint when you say, well, you may, you may know your goes out of, but you don't know your goes in there. <laughs> uh, I, sometimes, you know, it, it really depends. And, and nine out of 10 times when we get to a point where we can sit down and talk to those guys and say, okay, what are your concerns? And let me explain to you the data flows and let me explain to you why I think you should architect it this way. And architecting things for video flows is dramatically different than what you may be used to. They're almost looking for that entity that can speak their language. It's no different than, than when I first came in from the IT side into this market going on 18 plus years ago. I came in with a, a very, very strong IT background. And I, I remember my, my first days at, at, at Pelco, when someone w was talking about PMD protocol and all these things they call protocols. And I'm an IEEE looking for the standard. And I'm like, what is a PTZ protocol? And I'm looking for the <laughs> IEEE standard for PTZ and it doesn't exist. There is a disconnect in what you consider protocol and surveillance and what you consider it in the IT world. And it, it really, it still exists. You still have that disconnect. Well, having come from the integrator world, you know, and even if you do have the knowledge that you're talking about now and can speak um, factually to the IT department, it's, it's tough because most, not a lot of integrators carry, you know, the personnel inside with a CCIE on their badge where, you know, it gives them the, uh, you know, basically gives them carte blanche. Yeah. So what, what really the integrators need backing them up is, is a very sound and coherent narrative from the industry, uh, from the manufacturers, from SIA, from, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, uh, and from the security consultants, you know, to be basically speaking this model, 
you know, to the uh, to the industry and over to the you know to the IT teams. So you know they're just not hearing these one offs from an integrator okay. that's that's trying to do the right thing. But you know, as we've often seen, you know, many good deeds go don't do not go unpunished. You know, and and they'll get extricated <laughs> because they're not telling those guys what they want to hear. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. As an industry, we have to take a different approach. And this was, you know, lesson learned for me myself. I came in ready to educate everything, everybody from the IT side and ready to train everybody to become IT integrators. And they simply didn't want to do it. Some of them wanted it. Some of them didn't want to do it. And some of them didn't know what they were really getting into. And so over the years, I had to shift my thinking of rather than training, why don't we find a simpler way to do it? And we're going to see the same thing. You know, internally, we've developed this entire team, an amazing group of software developers that we have at, at BCD Video and infrastructure experts that are really targeting how do we take the things that we really need that are unobtainable and difficult to do today, or not, I shouldn't say unobtainable, but more difficult to get to. The industry is heading towards virtualization with VMware. And it's going to be every bit as, as difficult to transition as we did from analog to IP. So the approach we've taken is why not take these complicated technologies like virtualization and VMware and all these other technologies. And we have a group of software developers that use a platform they call Harmonize. And what they're doing is they're working on taking these, these complicated technologies and embedding them directly into the VMS platform. Meaning that within the VMS itself, you'll have a one or two button approach to spinning up a new virtual archiver or a one or two button approach to monitoring everything you have happening on the virtual side what your CPU utilization is, what your memory utilization is. They've even developed integration to iDRAC. So on the back of the Dell platforms that BCD is standardized on, iDRAC is your lifeline to what's going on with that server, your ability to see what's going on with the hard drives, what's going on with the memory, what's going on with the CPU. And we've embedded all of that directly into the VMS platform now through Harmonize. And the software developers have done a great job of bringing that in. And what that brings to the market is visibility. Because a security director who doesn't know about iDRAC and doesn't know about virtualization can look at a single pane of glass heads up display and say, there's a problem. And I know who to call based on what I'm seeing here. And that's what's critical. Well, that's a great uh, place. We'll take our, uh, take our second break and then we'll get a little deeper into that, uh, that approach. You are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by myself, Jim Henry and Sal Laferri. Invite you to and comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and subscribe and follow us on our social media. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So kind of relating that to... Uh, Hopefully, it's a, makes sense. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, our our users, you know, were first uh, exposed to computers. You know, they had to, you know, they wrestled with trying to set up their printers and get the printer drivers and get this on the network. And this doesn't see that, and that doesn't see this, and they're throwing their hands up. And you know, later generations of Windows, you know, would do the self discover and whatnot. So, Darren, what you're what you're talking about now is is not that far afield from that. What you're talking about with Harmonize, am I making a, a correct analogy? Absolutely, it's about providing a simplistic approach in an environment that people are familiar with. Security entities and end user level are used to dealing with the VMS platforms, and when you take the critical data and you present it to them in a format that they're used to working with, it becomes easier to deal with that technology. So, Sal, Sal I think you had a, a question. Yeah, I was just saying with all of the conversations that take place between the developers, the engineers, the, the people setting the switches, it all comes down to the conversation with the end user, the guy who's actually signing the check. And yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a classic ignorance that occurs with that. And you know, I'm listening to the conversation, you guys are talking mm -hmm. about how to, the, the need for the conversation between the programmers, the developers, the engineers. At what point does the industry recognize that the end user, the guy who's signing the check, is ignorant and needs to be educated? How do you break down that technology so that the end user understands it? Yeah, I think we're headed that direction for, for sure. Uh, it really is, what we focus on at BCD is channeling through the integrator to determine those end user needs. 
Uh, and, and a lot of the development we're doing now is directly based upon that channel communication. We're seeing that we can develop all these advanced technologies. And when I say we're heading towards virtualization in the industry, it's no different than what is happening in IT. There was uh, literally a virtualization kind of revolution that took place. And I see the same thing in surveillance today. When I look at an archive or when I look at something that's a recorder, on average, you're using 40% of the CPU and maybe 20% of the memory. So what happens to the rest of that, right? If you don't virtualize that and compartmentalize or contain it, then that's wasted resources. When I virtualize that, I may have an archiver, but I can also spin up an access control entity. And I can also spin up you know, other entities inside of that to effectively use those resources. And when you look at a project bid, you're going to see when people virtualize, the number of servers actually contracts or reduces because they're more, they're more effectively using the resources they have. But as you induce that complexity, you've got to have a way to make it readable in a human form. Somebody has to be able to manage that at the end user level without actually having to go out and get a high level of education to be able to do it. And that's what our goal is with the Harmonize platform. The idea is to take this technology and break it down into simplistic metrics that can be viewed inside the VMS that that end user is familiar with and get alerts within the, the, the VMS and guide them when they have problems as to who to contact or what's going on and provide real-time metrics. Because let's be honest, most surveillance directors don't have time to wait for the integrator to get on site. If they've got a problem, they need to drive resolution now. And those real-time statistics are going to allow you to drive problem resolution much, much faster. Well, it's always much more reassuring when you have some idea of um, of what's happening rather than my video's down. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, likewise, I you know we always find that that, that customers are 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 more understanding if if uh, you know when they do call the integrator, if the integrator can give them a little bit of a deeper dive into into you know where the issue is rather than hey we don't know we're sending somebody out you know because then you're you're just you're just blind. Yeah. So this 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 concept of um, of giving visibility into the you know being able to to address problems before they get worse or mm -hmm. understand where they are so if they if they are being targeted at least there's some sort of finite understanding of what it is and and what's being done and and how long may it take to to correct you know and and in a time when there's a lot of uh, debate about do I load all my stuff on premise. Do I go to the cloud? What do I do? What do I do? Right? You yeah. know, and coming from the old, you know, the old <laughs> integrator roots, you know, it's always like, you know, you got to triangulate, you got to have redundancy, you got to triangulate a problem, you've got to you have overlapping technologies for better detection. You know, you really want a hybrid approach, you know, with some on premise, you know, some at the edge, some in the cloud. And this, this approach, um, I think also maximizes that uh, kind of middle of the road solution to mitigate risk. Am I am I kind of on with that? You're 100 percent on target with that. So in our Harmonize platform, we partnered with a company called Tiger Technologies that specializes in embedding exactly what I'm saying into the VMS as well. So directly into the VMS, you have control over what stays local, what goes hybrid or private cloud, and what goes public cloud. We are moving towards a cloud-based architecture. However, Everybody's kind of hailing 5G as the great savior that's going to move us to the cloud. There are a lot of problems with that theory. And that is the majority of the VMS platforms today work off of what I call a redirect concept. If you take an IP camera, an IP camera is nothing more than a Linux-based PC with a CCTV imager and a lens on it. And you've got a finite uh, CPU, memory, and network interface resource there. So common problem when you have an explosion at a flour mill or problem at an auto production plant and 10 different people want to view that camera live, if you're streaming it directly from the camera via unicast, you're only going to get about three 30 frames per second 1080p images before that camera peaks above 85% and stops producing that. So to solve that in the industry, they did a redirect. They said, well, let's just go unicast to the recorder. The recorder is much, much more robust than what it has. And then we'll fan out who wants to request it from there. But you induce latency and you create a hairpin effect, meaning the data has to go through the recorder. So now you start talking about pushing that out to the cloud. You wind up hairpinning data out to the cloud and back for live view because of the way this was actually set up. Some vendors actually use multicast from the edge, which is a subscription base, basically. It's like a newspaper or a periodical. If you subscribe to it, you get it. 
and they send that stream out once and it goes where it needs to go based upon a subscription-based model. And that keeps the CPU on the camera from being overloaded, but brings a lot of complexity on multicast to the back end of the network. These are all things that we have to deal with because to be honest with you, the majority of the infrastructures out there and the VMS platforms are not two-tiered today. They still rely on hairpinning through the archivers and recorders. And that's not really a good fit for what we're looking at today with cloud. There are going to be some hurdles to get there. But you know, companies like Tiger Technologies and places that understand we're, we're moving towards this multi-tiered architecture and is working from the perspective of building that directly into the VMS is going to start to move people. They're going to start to see that this is the wave of the future. We need to be able to go either private cloud or off-prem public cloud. But right now, it's the same thing that we face today. If we don't make it simple and approachable, nobody's going to do it. Well, that's, I think then that's really, that's the key to making that transition. And again, in an industry that over and over and over proves that it takes sometimes five to 10 years more than the experts say a transition will take within the security industry. Do you think that that is as, as accurate a statement in 2020, 2021, as it was 20 years ago, 40 years ago, when we were really dealing with an industry that had a lot of old legacy son, Sal, and uh, present company excluded, you know, retired law enforcement, <laughs> you know, in the industry, because there's a lot more technically savvy, you know, people in the industry now, both in management, you know, as well as in the in in the technology fields. Is does that bode for for a higher rate of acceptance now of this latest trend? It's tough to say. I'll tell you this. Uh, when I first came into the industry going on almost 18, 20 years ago, when I first started dabbling, I was still uh, teaching college at that point. And the first thing I heard was IT is coming in and taking over this industry. They're taking over the infrastructure. They can control everything. 18, 20 years later, it still hasn't happened. Everything we push out the door, with the exception of Fortune 500 companies and large companies that, that really have a solid IT infrastructure and staff, these are all still networks that are being deployed by the security integrators. Nothing's really changed. And this big evolution or revolution that's going to happen, that's going to move everything over to the IT side, still hasn't happened. So I don't think you're going to see much of a different kind of role play out here. I think you're going to wind up with everything's moving to the cloud, everything's moving to the cloud tomorrow. And I think it's a little bit farther off than we think. I think that there are going to be entities that cloud makes sense. But I can tell you right now, when I look at cloud and I we started looking at CCDV or surveillance as a service while I was at Avaya, and we started thinking about all these different things that you could do through these service providers to, to act as a backbone and cloud providers to provide surveillance. And every time somebody wanted to do it, I would show them the bill for the resilient service provider connections they would require based upon the 300 cameras they have on site. And when they saw the bill on what it was going to take to get that kind of service provider bandwidth, they all backed off. And I think we're still at that same challenge. 5G has the potential to give us direct point-to-point -point connection, but unleashes a whole other gamut of infrastructure-related issues that the VMS platforms simply aren't built for that today. They're going to have to be rebuilt and repurposed for that. That's the crash and burn that I'm worried about. Of people jumping on that uh, on that key word saying, oh, that's going to solve everything. And you have just a whole lot of collisions and problems coming up because people over overstated the problem, you know, the, the problems that 5G was going to solve, including and peace in our time. <laughs> 5G is, is going to solve a lot of things for edge computing. If I'm in a self-driven, you know, car from Tesla or somebody, and there are sensors that are IoT devices on the side of the road that can pick hazards up, things like that. Tell me I need to shift lanes. Tell me there's an accident ahead. I should apply the brakes, things like that. Those are life and death decisions. And those are things that need to happen at what's called edge compute or the edge of the network. And those are things that need to happen in real time. Most of what we do in surveillance doesn't happen in real time. It's post-analytic. An event happens and we review it. So yes, there's a predictive nature to it at some point. But 5G is really meant to drive edge computing and pushing computing out to the edge and giving you the promise of, of two millisecond latency for everything. But if the API infrastructure for the software resides back in a data center in Omaha, it doesn't matter that you have two millisecond latency. You still have to hairpin it back to get a response. And from my perspective, what we do in surveillance just isn't at that point where we think we need that kind of response. It's almost right. always post-analytic. 
You're very right. There's a, a brand that you're a uh, brand name now for for your solutions called uh, called Revolve. Why don't you explain uh, you know what that is and how that relates to the Harmony uh, platform you talked about? So, so Revolve in the last you know series of years in the industry, hyperconvergence has been a buzzword, right? And hyperconvergence is meant to provide high availability and it's meant to solve problems that people see on site. So if I have an archiver and that's holding a certain amount of data. We built software entities and BMS platforms. If that archiver fails, I redirect my cameras to record somewhere else so I don't stop recording. And yeah, there's some latency gaps or there's some gaps in video that'll happen during the transition, but you stay recording. You're not responding to that failure in the middle of the night. What you don't get with that is until if you can recover that server and that data, you can't get access to any of that video. It's gone until a technician comes out and repairs the motherboard or fixes the CPU or the memory problem or the power supplies, all of that archival data is gone and you can't get it back. And that's what HCR Hyperconverged was meant to, to kind of approach. The fact that we take a group of these servers and we put them in a cluster and we share CPU, we share memory, and we share storage resources. And you create something called virtual machine mobility to where if the virtual machine for Windows that the archiver is running on, that machine fails, it'll simply migrate to other machines to operate. And the storage is shared on all of them. So when it fails, not only does it recover, you get all your data back. Your data is not gone. And that's what people love about the hyperconvergence approach. The problem is what we do in this industry is asymmetric with respects to resource depletion. If you take a look at CPU memory and storage, I can tell you every day of the week, we deplete storage a thousand times faster than the CPU and memory. And the problem that I see with the hyperconverged approach is every time I want to add more storage, I have to buy another server with more CPU and more memory that I might not need. Disaggregation is happening on the IT side. They're looking at HCI 2.0 and they're pulling the storage out in the way and getting that same VM mobility, but they're storing the data back on SAN and NAS devices that already have five nines of availability, that already have industry proven resilience and, and longevity for data because they, they realize that there's this asymmetric depletion of resources. And so that's what we've done with Revolve. Right around the same time, the IT side of the businesses started to make the shift from HP to Dell and everybody else started to look at HCI 2.0 or disaggregation. We did the same thing. We build the cluster and we put all SSD in the cluster for high performance for the VMS platform, for the, the Windows base that it runs on, and for the databases. And we give it mobility. If a box fails, that role will move to another box. But we then target all the video storage back to either a SAN or a NAS or off-prem or on-prem private cloud. All of those are options. Those are industry-proven standards that you're not going to lose data. So we can accomplish the exact same thing of what people like about pure HCI, but we can do it at a reduced cost. And we can do it without having to waste resources, buying more compute power when you don't need it. It's well, all about a, high availability. That's a great... Uh... That's a great place to uh, to put it in a pregnant pause and say that we're we're planning on doing a, a follow up podcast on just that because that is really a very a very significant development that uh, brings in again the benefits of HCI but but eliminates some of the unnecessary baggage and cost of that of that infrastructure. So, uh, Darren, as as a follow up, uh, how how would you uh, how would you suggest people uh, you know contact you or BCD for additional questions? Oh, absolutely. So they can reach out to our website. You can go to BCD or you can contact me at djacomini at bcdinc.com. Um, you can reach out to me directly if you have any questions uh, about what we're discussing here. And you can get all of our contact info directly from our website or reach out to any of our sales entities that can redirect you to me as well. Sal, any closing comments on your side? No, I tell you, I'm, uh, it's kind of interesting. It, um, you know, I, I always try and look at it from the, you know, the guy who's going to sign the check and what's important to know. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I always find this fascinating that there's all it is going on in the background. And, you know, when you early on, when you were talking about how, you know, the integrators could be having trouble and, you know, how the end user is pissed at an integrator and says, you know, your service sucks and they go to the next one and the next one. You know, and, and not just understanding what those problems are. And, you know, I just think that there's there's just got to be a whole lot more of education to not necessarily the end user as the guy installing it, but the guy who's signing the check and letting them realize the problems. 
because obviously a lot of the issues that they contend with later on is poor decisions that they made in the beginning, whether it was budgetary reasons or yeah. going with a brother-in-law system and trying to grow into it. And so it's, you know, it's just sort of fascinating to, to see the whole, the whole perspective of it. I, I always say this, Sal, it, it doesn't matter what car you're driving if it's a bad road. And being from California, we have a lot of bad roads here. Yeah. If you ever spend any time in the slow lane towing something, it's horrible. I mean, you're bouncing all over the place. And it's not going to get better until you fix the underlying infrastructure. And it's kind of a problem that, that really almost plagues the industry because we still ignore it. We think infrastructure is infrastructure. If the port lights up, it's going to be okay. But those problems manifest themselves as VMS and camera problems that a VMS and camera vendor cannot fix. Yeah. And a lot of times those issues wind up, you know, they were bad decisions in the very beginning when, it, when the system initially was bought. Absolutely. So it's, yeah, it, it's problematic. But really, thank you for uh, your time. It's, it's, this is great. I'm really looking forward to uh, the second podcast and learn more about hyperconvergence. Yeah, us as well. All righty. You have been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by myself, Jim Henry and Sal Ferrari. We ask you subscribe to this show. And like us on our social media, we remind you and ask if you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. Remember, you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform, YouTube, and of course, stream it at theriskadvisor.com. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you tune in again next week. Your business may be small, but you've got big goals. Brother Laser Printers can help you succeed, no matter the space, task, or budget. From crisp black and white to vivid full color, our printers offer affordable quality you can trust. Plus, fast printing and high page yields make them ideal for home offices and shared workspaces. It's no wonder Brother is the number one retail brand in laser printer unit sales in the U.S. With Brother at your side, go from small to do it all. Shop now at brother-usa.com laser. Streaming only on Peacock. John Wayne Gacy killed 32. Straight from the killer's mouth. They want you to believe that I alone committed these murders. The new gripping six-part documentary series, John Wayne Gacy, Devil in Disguise. All episodes streaming now, only on Peacock. 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 Now, only on Peacock.